Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Kanita. All thy works praise your name. Look around the room right now. You see a lot of works. You all are works. And your presence here uh, shows the glory of God. Welcome. Let's continue in worship this morning by bringing up our president, Dr. Roy Peterson. You know, Dr. Roy Peterson is a big fan and cheerleader of trauma healing, both here at ABS and around the world, and his wife, Rita, is a master facilitator, and we have benefited from her expertise. So, Roy, would you come and bring us the word and continue our worship time this morning? So, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to greet you this morning, and thank you for, for your presence and what that represents for the hurting around the world. It's an honor for us at American Bible Society to serve the Alliance and to uh, be a servant to this, uh, this incredible tool and practice that we're seeing expand into more and more nations. If my math is correct, this is our eighth year to have a community of practice. And hi, Kathy. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, we, uh, we celebrate the continuity and the growing scale and scope that's happening, the learning that's happening over these years. And we're marveling at how God is taking our humble efforts and ministering right before our eyes to thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And it's really his ministry, isn't it? It really is a reflection of his heart for the hurting and his desire for the church to be a place of, of healing. So I'm thankful for your presence, a presence and a community gathered to honor the Father and to serve others. It's such an encouragement to me to be, have a small part in, in what is happening here. And I believe God is pleased too, and he sees our hands and our feet moving towards the hurting. I believe we're living out what the Lord Jesus taught in Luke 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up and to test Jesus and said, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Wasn't that a good answer? Mm, a good answer yeah. to Jesus. He had a really good answer for him. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so we asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answers that question with a story, a story of a suffering man, which is quite familiar to everyone in this room, a man who others were passing by, a man who received care in this circumstance from an unlikely stranger. And by the end of the story, Jesus makes his final point. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell wounded at the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And then these words from Jesus are meant for us to meditate on, resonate in our heart today, to remember these are the words that brought you to a training like this, an experience like this. These are the words that move us to use our humble efforts to serve others. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Would everyone say that with me out loud? Go and do likewise. likewise. Jesus is clear about our role for the church. He wants us to have mercy on the hurting. He wants us to love our neighbors. I look around this room and I see God's hands of mercy and feet that run towards the action. I see God's love in action. I visited so many places in, in the world where this ministry is happening and it gives me great joy to be with you today. Each of you love the Lord and love his word. Each of you have experienced his healing love in one form or another and you know his word heals, you know he's a healer. And so you step forward in faith knowing that what he did for you, he'll do for others. And you're actively seeking to be a healer. 
But who is it that runs towards tragedy? We really become God's hands and feet. And it's very humbling to think of that, that we actually become his hands and feet to hurting people. I have the privilege in my office at the other end of the building, over in the corner, I guess he has maybe the better office, is Colonel James Pucci. Is, is Jim here with us today? He's, he's one of our senior leaders in U.S. ministry. And you'll have to pull this story from him. He won't volunteer it. But he was at the Pentagon on 9-11, 2001. And if you ask Jim what happened and what did he do, he ran towards where the plane went into the Pentagon. He ran towards the need. As a military officer, that was his training. Incredible courage to run towards the tragedy. And you have no idea what else is going to happen next, what's going to explode. What, it's a complete selflessness to go towards the hurting, not knowing what's going to happen to yourself. Some years later, we had a bombing in Boston. And I was watching the news that day, riveted to this scene. And they quickly, many of you may remember this moment, they quickly unfolded and showed the video footage of when the explosions went off. And there were three types of characters in the, in the drama. The, the, the mass of characters, the, char the, the, the mass of humanity, did what we all would probably do, and that's duck, or run away from where they heard the perceived danger to be. And so you had this mass of humanity running away or ducking to the ground. And then you had some individuals, some unusual individuals, who were running towards the trauma. Medical personnel, trained nurses, doctors, maybe military people, maybe first responders. That happen. Who knows what training it took for them to go towards the tragedy. But then you had this unusual scene of two terrorists who were walking down the street as if nothing happened. And the cameras caught that. The cameras caught the fact that these two men, they weren't scared, they weren't running towards it, they weren't running away from it. They were just strolling like nothing had happened. And the police immediately knew these two must be suspects. And that footage and their behavior led to their capture, their quick capture. Of course, in my heart and mind that day, I was looking at the ones running towards the tragedy knowing that they represent the Father, they represent the church. And I want to thank each of you for running towards and moving toward, taking your organizations, whatever influence you have, towards the hurting and the wounded. This year's community of practice is focusing on trauma within the family. And we think about who can hurt us most deeply. It's those that are most close to us. And so we can imagine how traumatizing it is when we're wounded within the family unit by those we love. Our woundedness came from an accident. Some of you may know that Reed and I lost our 16-year-old son, Dean, in a tragic car accident. He was in the back seat with another teenager driving who lost control at a high speed. The two boys up front the doors opened up and they stood out and they did not even need medical care. Dean in the back seat where the tree hit died within seven days. It shattered our world. Some would say, well, grief is not trauma. Well, there's, there's elements of grief that are exactly trauma, as a matter of fact. And one of those griefs that is directly related to trauma is when it shatters our worldview and our theology. It shatters our perception of who God is. In our young understanding of God, and we had just gone to the mission field, it was our first year on the mission field. In our theology, we were serving God at, at, uh, at great cost. Um, and, and of course, he would bless us for, for taking those steps of faith. So it did not fit our paradigm that he would immediately allow a tragedy and a loss 
to come in. It, we had to reframe our understanding and build in a theology of suffering into our worldview, which is so prevalent in Scripture, we just hadn't discovered it in our young Christian lives. Consequently, because of that darkness, we went into the darkest period of our, our marriage. We experienced a sense of hopelessness, of confusion. Then who is he? If he's not who we thought he is, who is this father that we thought loved us and would protect us and would bless us? We didn't have trauma healing. Rita did get professional counseling. We were living in Quito, Ecuador at the time, and she did receive wonderful counseling over a period of, of, of a couple years that really began to open up light again. And our hope began to be rekindled. But the key thing that happened was that through scripture and understanding our theology was healed and improved and more directly realistic about what God allows into the lives of those who follow him. God in his goodness and sovereignty breathed life back into us again. We were so close to quitting and giving up. It took years. But you know, the Father shows his strength in our frailty. His word helped us in the darkest places. We still continue to glean from that loss to this day. Rita dedicated her life to getting the training, becoming a licensed clinic, a clinical counselor. She volunteers here, as Phil mentioned, in trauma healing. And we think about the suffering people go through around the world who don't know the Lord yet or don't have his word, and it just seems unfair, unjust, that someone could suffer such terror, war, the horrors of what's happening in our world, and not have immediate access to his word. And so we would love to make his word and this training available to every nation, that there'd be churches in every nation trained to be healers for whatever their nation is going through. That's why we're all here, isn't it? And you know, we're in this together. We can't do this alone. I think of the generosity of the four authors and of SIL and of the Alliance partners represented in this room today. I want to stop and thank that cohort, the authors, SIL, and the Alliance partners. Let's thank them for their generosity. <laughs> Because we, we can't do this alone. We can't do it without each other. We need each other. We're learning from each other during these three days. We encourage each other through the stories we share. So make sure you share your stories with one another of how you're seeing God work. Share your struggles too. And, and, and maybe there'll be insights that you'll take away from here. Um, we're beginning to invest more deeply in trauma healing here in the US. For a couple years now, we've been working with a small, co small cohort of prison chaplains, and we're getting more and more requests from pastors in the cities in the U.S. who want to have, they want to be a place of healing in their cities. Um, we're working, uh, using these materials for racial rec reconciliation and generational trauma. Um, and as strategies develop, we're relying on learnings that we're getting from you to apply in the places that we're serving. So thank you for sharing what you're learning along the way. It's a rich exchange that will happen in a place like this during these three days. And so we want to dedicate this time to the Lord. We want to open our hearts and minds to all he has for us. And we want to dream a dream that this, this ministry will flow out to more and more nations. Please allow me to pray for you as I close. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you all the glory for what you're doing here, and thank you for each one. Thank you for the authors and for the organizations that are giving so generously to serve you in this way. I pray, Lord, over these next three days that each one here will be refreshed, that there'll be a, a fresh connection, that there'll be learning, that your Holy Spirit will move on each one. Thank you for the worship time we've already had this morning and how that refreshes our spirit. Thank you for all the teachers are here. I was thinking especially this morning of Dr. Langberg and others who will share their insights so that they might encourage and bless and train and mentor everyone here today. I pray that we would uncover new truths by your Holy Spirit, that we might make some new friends and gain some new insights, and that you might stir up in our heart a new vision of hope that you are on the move, that you are at work, 
and that you're using even us to make a difference in our world. We pray for your work in our midst this week, Lord, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you, and I close with these uh, four words from Jesus. Go and do likewise. Have a great day. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, for sharing with us your personal story of pain and healing and also the word. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to, to hear from you and to receive your support for trauma healing. Well, welcome to the 2019 Global Community of Practice. Thank you all for making it and coming. And for those of you who are live and streaming, we're glad for you as well. We know that there are ways for you to communicate and, and give us messages, so please do that. Folks will be uh, ferrying them up here from time to time when we have Q&A, so we'll want to hear from you. Um, so know that, folks, you're not the only people. There are watching parties around the world right now um, and uh, participating, praying with, participating, thinking along the same lines and sharing. So uh, we're even larger than what it looks like here. So. My name is Phil Monroe, and I am the Director of Training Materials here, and I know many of you, so I'll be looking to, to greet you, but if you're new to me, make sure especially uh, you come see me, but um, it's so great to be here together. We have a lot packed in this morning already, um, and so we'll have different folks coming up here to, to uh, sort of point you in good directions. This morning our MC will be Frederick Barasa. Where did you go? Uh, uh, Barasa, there he is over here. Uh, Barasa knows everybody in every country. And if you are ever needing the guy, you ask, f you ask Barasa because he has the guy uh, who's probably helped him out of some bind, right? <laughs> but he's our program manager for trauma healing here, one of our program managers as well. So he'll be coming up this morning and guiding you along the way. Um, the theme, as Dr. Peterson said, is trauma in the family. The family can be the source of trauma. It can be, have, bear much of the effects of trauma. It is also the source and participation of the healing process, as we will hear this morning, thinking uh, from Dr. Langberg about what the family is designed for by God. So that's where we're starting out this morning. We'll have breakouts. Uh, but I want to invite up uh, Sarah Dolan right now. Sarah Dolan, and give her a warm welcome. <laughs> if anything goes well this week, it's because Sarah planned it. If it goes poorly, it's because we failed to deliver. <laughs> but Sarah uh, has been the mastermind and is on our operations team here and spends much of her year planning for this community of practice. So welcome, Sarah. She'll give us the directions, all the things that you really need to know. <laughs> yep. I think the podium is taller than I am. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you here again. Um, I know some of you have traveled many, many miles and many hours to get here. Some of you have just braved the Schuylkill Expressway to get here. So no matter where you're coming from, we're really excited to have you here and filling this room um, today for the next few days. So welcome. As Phil mentioned, I just have a few logistical announcements um, that I wanted to go over with you this morning. First and most importantly, we really want to make sure that you have everything that you need while you're here for the next few days. So if you need anything, you have any questions, just look for someone who is wearing one of these red Ask Me buttons. That means that they are on our ABS staff here and they'll be able to help you with any questions you have or anything that you need. Okay, in your folders today, you'll find an information sheet um, that has some helpful information for the next few days together, whether that is tips for how to get in and out of the building more easily and quickly, um, or how to connect to the Wi-Fi while you're here, which you'll actually need in a couple of minutes. So if you haven't connected to the internet, now would be a good time to do that. Um, but so just take a minute um, over the next few days to look through everything on that sheet. 
A couple of things that aren't there, but I wanted to mention. We have a reflection room set up for you this year. We're really grateful for the feedback that we received after the gathering last year about needing um, a quiet and peaceful place to go if you need a few minutes just to reflect or pray at some point during the next couple of days. So we have a room set up for that purpose. So thank you so much for providing that feedback on your surveys. Um, during the morning and afternoon breaks in that room, There'll be an ABS volunteer available if you would like prayer for your ministry or any personal requests. There'll be someone available in that room to pray with you and over you if that's something that you're interested in. We'll have um, also during the morning and afternoon breaks, we'll have the THI core materials for sale out in the lobby just outside of these doors. So if you'd like to look at any of the books or purchase any of them, They'll be available in the morning and the afternoon. We also have against the wall over on the right hand side um, some extra hats and gloves and scarves for any of you who are coming from a warmer climate and finding our Philadelphia March winter weather not to your liking and it's that you think it's really cold. Those are available for you. You can feel free to take anything you might need and that's yours to keep then. I think we learned our lesson after last year and we have placed that basket very far away from the general coat racks which are outside of this room. <laughs> Some of you may remember that from last year, that was our bad. Um, so anything for free is in the basket over here. Anything on the coat rack, please don't take that unless it already belongs to you. <laughs> okay, and then finally, um, as I said, we just we really want you to feel welcome and at home while you're here with us this week. If you'd like to walk around at any point and see more of the office, we will have a tour available during the lunch break tomorrow. Um, I just need to get a quick show of hands if you're interested in taking a tour of the office so I know how many tour guides we'll need. So if you're interested, if you could just pop your hand up. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think that's it for me for now. Maybe not for the next three days, but at least for right this moment. So thank you very much, and welcome again. We're glad you're here. Uh, Jerry, Jerry. Hey, um, like Phil introduced, my name is Frederick Barasa. And again, I want to welcome you all uh, for the 2019 uh, COP. I have uh, had the privilege of attending all the uh, community of practice since 2012. So glad to see us continuing to grow. And before I, we move into our next session of introduction, I just want, I was sharing with Margaret Hill yesterday. Where is Margaret? Uh, um, I came to learn around about trauma healing back in 2007. Uh, in Nairobi when um, Margaret Hill came to our office and invited uh, us or invited me to go and uh, attend a training in EA South Sudan in 2007. I bought the ticket, was ready to go, but things did not happen. I ended up not um, attending the training until 2011 in February in Goma. So I never knew that I'll be here. That was 2007 now, this is 2019 and here we are uh, doing trauma healing. So God works in ways that no one knows. <laughs> so um, we are going to introduce ourselves um, around the table. We want to hear stories around the table. We want to hear to do all of you to know each other. What's your name? Which country you come from? Uh, share your name, where you are from, uh, where you work. Uh, share one thing that God has done um, through your trauma healing ministry. And I want to reconnect to what uh, Dr. Roy Peterson said in his devotion, uh, he said that I hope this will be uh, a rich exchange, but more important that you'll be able to share your stories. And so for the next 15 minutes, I encourage you to introduce yourself, take a minute or two to introduce yourself. No long stories. I know you guys, you love to fellowship and to talk. We have 15 minutes. Introduce yourself. After 15 minutes, I'll come back and introduce the next speaker. So stories are from around the table. Go ahead and introduce yourselves.
Okay, uh, we have uh, two, three minutes to go, so uh, signal, wind, keep winding up. Okay, one minute to go, one minute to go, get seated. Yes, but yes, but Jerry has it. Okay, um, okay, um, uh, okay, I think we are good now. I hope you had a good time sharing and getting to know what each one, uh, each ministry and uh, just sharing your experience on what God has done through your ministry. So, uh, next we want to hear uh, about Trauma Healing Institute news. And to do that, um, I want to introduce um, Andrew Hood. Andrew Hood uh, briefly is the Vice President Global Ministry here at American Bible Society and he stepped into his current position as Vice President in July 2018. Uh, Andrew joined uh, American Bible Society in 2011 and has led uh, communication uh, and trauma healing ministry here at uh, American Bible Society. His leadership experience in Clue is in, uh, is in business, hospitality, communication, and ministry. And so, um, help me to bring Andrew Hood here to share with us uh, uh, news about Trauma Healing Institute. Andrew. Should I talk about the main position? No, I'll do it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, you are really smart, and you are experienced, and we want to hear from you uh, throughout our time together, not just from people who have a microphone in front of them. One of the ways that we're um, making it possible to hear from you during our time together, not just during this particular presentation, but throughout the next few days, um, is through a tool called Mentimeter. It requires you to get out your phone, and it's okay. Um, if I'm doing my presentation and I see you on your phone, I will not be offended. Um, and so I'd like to invite you now to get out your phone and to open a, a browser and go to menti.com. And we will practice for the first opportunity uh, to do this. So I'll just take a second to do this. For future um, opportunities, you might just see something on the screen and you might or might not be prompted by someone up front. But anytime you come in and see something on the screen about Menti, feel free to go in and participate. I'm, I'm going to be talking with you about um, a communications tool that we just created. One of the most frequent challenges that I hear from people is that it's kind of hard to communicate about trauma healing, to explain what, what it is, um, how it works, why it matters, how to get involved, 
basic questions like that. And so we've created something that, um, we, that we believe you could take and customize for your ministry and for your, um, for your context. So I'd like to you to go to the site, enter that code, and answer this question. What are your biggest challenges in communicating about trauma healing? And then uh, my hero, Jerry, is going to switch the screen so that we can actually see your responses popping up. You can see in the bottom right of the screen that 10 people have, 11 people have responded so far. 12, 13, anyway, I won't count. Um, and this will allow you to see other people's responses as well. So there's two benefits to this. One is that we can all participate and you can get a voice and you can see what other people are saying. But secondarily, uh, we can also go back and look at these and as we're creating tools for the global community of practice, we can have your input and feedback. Uh, based on these. So even if we move on from this slide, please continue to go ahead and put in your response here. So what qualifies as trauma? Great question. Anyway, thanks, Jerry. <laughs> <coughs> uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the tool for you, and then uh, we'll have one more opportunity, so keep your phone ready to go. So what I'm going to show you is something that will be made available to you uh, that will walk you through those basic questions of what is trauma healing, how does it work, why does it matter, how do we get involved. This is the intro where uh, Trauma Healing Institute, you can, you can, all this is customizable, you can replace your own ministry name here, you can update this. Um, some of the principles that we had in mind as we created this was, number one, keep it simple, number two, Make it work for the whole church. Number three, make it so that people who are not familiar with church language can understand it. Uh, or people who have been hurt by church language, that they wouldn't be hurt by this, the way that this is worded. So if you want to turn up the volume on scripture, you can add Bible passages to this or uh, you can kind of t turn up the volume on churchy language if that fits your context, but know that we've designed this to be very honest about the fact that this is rooted in scripture and that this is um, <clears throat> an act of God in the heart of people in community. Um, but we've also tried to make it very, keep it very simple and clear. So I'll just run through real quick rather than talk about it. I'll actually show it to you. Some experiences in life are so painful that they cause deep and lasting suffering. That suffering is what we call trauma. Trauma is a deep wound, whoop, trauma is a deep wound of the heart mind that takes a long time to heal. It hurts every part of us, our relationships, our bodies, our thoughts, and our faith. But God is with everyone who suffers. God feels our pain with us, and God helps us heal. The light of love is stronger than the darkness of trauma. This is why we have hope. Trauma Healing Institute provides a way for suffering people all over the world to find healing in the midst of their pain. With the strength and support of others, they experience God's nearness and love. Our method is simple. It brings a group of people together in a safe place where they can help each other heal. As they meet together, people in healing in a healing group, learn how to talk about their own pain and listen to the pain of others. In healing groups, people discover that they are not alone. They find comfort for their hearts and minds in God who cares for all of us and in a community that walks the road of healing with them. There are five characteristics of this method that make it uniquely effective. So here we get into the distinctives of this particular approach to trauma healing for the church. First, it brings together proven mental health practices and the wisdom of the Bible in a way that's accessible to everyone. This is something that um, would be, uh, if, you, if you remove either the biblical component or the mental health component, uh, you would not have this trauma healing um, program. I'm going to go more quickly through these. Is that what you're telling me? Or No, sorry. <laughs> um, 
Second, it's, a, it's designed for anyone to use with simple language and clear ideas that are easy to understand. Third, it happens in small groups led by trained facilitators who don't need to be professional counselors. Fourth, it uses a participatory <coughs> format to help people engage deeply with themselves, with God, and with each other. Fifth, it's adaptable, so people can use it anywhere in the world in any language or culture. I know I'm going quickly through this, but the idea is not to have you memorize this entire thing or to fully um, soak it in, uh, but mainly to uh, expose you to it so that you can get a sense of what we're trying to accomplish, whether this would work for you, um, and how valuable this might be for you, and what advice you might have for us. This isn't fully baked yet, but it's getting close, and so we thought it would be good to show you so that we can get your feedback about how helpful this might be. We go on to talk about communities and how the same thing, the same process that happens within the heart of an individual happens within the systems of families and communities. Um, we talk about the materials. At the heart of our method is a book called Healing the Wounds of Trauma, which contains a set of practical lessons that lead people on a journey of healing. At the heart of the book is the Bible, which tells us about the love of God. <laughs> and again, you can customize this for your own, uh, for your own context. So it really highlights the participatory nature of this, the community setting, the importance of the church, and the fact that this is a journey, that we're not just cranking out healed people. Um, if you go through this equation, you will be healed, but that this is, this is really a process. Um, so we help people and organizations come together to support one another in the work of trauma healing. We call those groups communities of practice. Like we talked about last year, um, we are, this event that you're at is not the community of practice. You are the community of practice. Uh, you're a community. And this is the community of practice gathering. And so what we're trying to, to highlight here is that there are communities of practice regionally um, that are developing and maturing around the world. So using your Mentimeter tool. Um, and if you didn't do it the first time and you want to do it this time, again, just open a browser and go to menti.com. Use that code and help us get a sense for how useful would this communications tool be for you or your ministry. Uh, we could provide this to you in a power, an editable PowerPoint so that you could show this uh, when you're going to introduce this to someone. We could provide a PDF for you that you could print out. Uh, and we could probably get this into like, you know, or you could email to someone. Eventually, this kind of language, uh, as we develop it, will help us, um, you know, reframe our website and other materials. So as you see, 71, wow, you guys are great. 72 people have responded so far, and we're getting an 8.6 out of 10. So that's, that's a positive. Um, but feel free to find me over the next few days. Um, if you have any questions or advice or guidance about how we can make this tool as effective as possible for you, um, I would really love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Drew. And as he has said, keep engaging him. Uh, you can always uh, we'll love to hear from you about this uh, uh, tool that we have. So next, we have on our uh, schedule of events, we have trauma healing progress to date. And uh, to do that is uh, Dr. Harriet Hill. Dr. Harriet Hill is the director of content uh, here uh, in the trauma healing ministry at American Bible Society. Uh, she joined uh, uh, ABS in 2010, and she's been involved in trauma healing since 2001, and is one of the original authors of Healing Wounds of Trauma. Uh, Dr. Harriet received her uh, doctorate from Fuller School of uh, Inter Intercultural Studies 
specializing in scripture engagement. I guess that's why you are in trauma healing, Harriet. So please help me to welcome, I call her the professor and mother and architect of trauma healing, Harriet Hill. Good morning. We all like to, it always makes my day when I get a little conversation with Barasa. I know many of you have the same experience. Um, I lived for many years in an African village and uh, next to me at the end of the day, uh, my neighbor was Monsieur Gabriel. And I would go out and really sit under his mango tree, believe it or not, and just pass the time. And he, he said to me an Ajukru proverb that we uh, shared, I enjoyed quite a bit. There is no good without some bad, and there is no bad without some good. And so as we work in trauma healing, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge harvest field. There's lots of thorns and thistles, but let's just step away from that for a moment and see what God has done through this last 12 months through us as a community of practice. Uh, this is beyond what any of us could have done on our own. This is the um, activities map. I have the one printed out here from last year, 2018, and you will see quite a significant number of additions, dots on this map. I showed it to a group recently and they, they said, uh, there's a big dark space there where, it, where China is. And so that uh, is an area where there's not much presence, but you see the presence growing in Latin America, in the US, and in different places. We want to praise God for that. Um, Roy uh, talked about having trauma healing in every nation of the world. The ABS Bible, one of the verses of Bible society is in Habakkuk, that the knowledge of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So every year we want to look, how are we doing? <laughs> and you see the progress uh, now in 109 nations. This uh, comes from the database, so it is what is reported in the database, and we eliminate, if we haven't heard anything for five years, we take it off because uh, we feel like maybe that is no longer going on. So this is what we know about, and there's some countries where uh, trauma healing has just started this year. Last year, you saw this slide, for those of you who are with us. We're not just interested in going into as many countries as we can, as fast as we can. We are interested in really establishing trauma healing that can exist and bear fruit on its own. So we've made three rough categories of seedlings. That's where we just started. There is something that actually happened in a country, and there's a plan for you know, next steps. Rooting, where um, the plant still needs some attention, some inputs to really grow strong, and then established, where it's bearing fruit and really, you know, feeding those around it, and established and able to uh, go forward. So as we look at this, um, we see that the number of established countries with established programs has gone from 13 to 21 in this year. And um, all of the numbers are increasing. And um, I would say, in looking at the data, the trajectory of going from seedling to an established program is getting much shorter. Praise God. We're learning. <laughs> We're learning. We're cooperating. There's many agencies working together. Um, it's, 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 seedlings are great, but if you're not going to really water them and care for them, it's a little bit of a wasted effort. So we're, we're learning more how to do this. We also had a uh, growth in the number of facilitators by about 4,000 this year. The, year. the time before it was about 2,500 new facilitators. So you see this multiplication thing happening. And it's, it's really... Um, we prayed for laborers in the harvest field, and you see that God is bringing them through your efforts and the efforts of many who are not present here or listening. In terms of uh, facilitators, the classic facilitators are now about 12,000, no, 11,000, up quite significantly. Um, I want to point out for the children's facilitators, look at that leap. I want to give a round, a round of applause for Margie. <laughs> really uh, put in the time, and, and all of you who are working in children's trauma healing. The story-based has not had that kind of uh, growth, and 
again, with the children's is there are 13 teen facilitators now with that new curriculum coming out for that incredibly important population. Master facilitators continue to grow about 50 per year. Um, and then uh, this is uh, where we see the classic program is growing the most, but the children's is now really taking a little bit more of an incline as well. So that's wonderful. Look at the uh, kinds of sessions, convening, equipping, and healing. Look at that healing number, healing groups. Yeah. And that's one of the places where the rubber meets the road. That's where the ministry is focused, and everything else is looking towards that. Uh, the languages um, is not quite as uh, encouraging. We had not as much development in the, in the translation and number of languages with materials and new products uh, being translated, and we could ask ourselves why, because there may be something that we should look at there. Um, this is pretty much, uh, there was a huge leap in publication, in translations from 2017 to 2018, but between these two years, not much, and why, we don't, we need to look at that, I think. And this is the kinds of products, again, uh, just I want to point out um, the audio programs where we have the trauma healing on 30-minute programs that can be broadcast on the radio or on other devices is growing significantly, 25% growth, and thanks to Debbie, uh, Debbie, Debbie, <laughs> Debbie Wolcott and her team for their, I, when you hear her stories, <laughs> it's, it's not easy. <laughs> and then on this slide as well, we have a TV programs, two of them now, and the teen program. These are our new, some of the new products that have come out this year, the teen disaster booklet, Generational Trauma for the U.S., Finding Our Comfort in God, that's the beautiful cover uh, designed in Jordan um, that will be coming out. It's for our Muslim-friendly uh, uh, version, an abortion lesson, Strength from Weakness is our nine new lessons. You'll hear more about that. And the Farsi TV programs have finally been aired, praise God. <laughs> We heard this verse already once today, those who wept as they went out carrying the seed will come back singing for joy as they bring in the harvest. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> okay, um, next, um, next we have a keynote address, as we've been told, this is our eighth COP, and uh, eighth? Yes. And so this will be the eighth uh, address by our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Diane Lenberg. Uh, to introduce Diane, I went on Google, and I went on Wikipedia, and this is what I found. <laughs> uh, she is the co-chair Trauma Healing Advisory Council since 2010, and the Advisory Council provides insights and wisdom. In 2011, Diane and Phil, where's Phil? Phil is somewhere, <laughs> traveled to Eastern DRC to see healing wounds of trauma in action. She is, what I found, a practicing uh, psychologist, or in America, in the US we call them therapists, for the last 45 years. And she's been, um, like I said, plenary speaker since 2007, sorry, 2012. She has written several books on trauma and widely known expert on treating survivors of sexual abuse. And therefore, uh, I welcome uh, Diane uh, to speak to us uh, next. And as she comes, uh, we use Mentimeter with the Drew. This, again, is going to be there on here for us to engage. And if you hear any word that comes when she presents, please feel free to post that on Mentimeter as uh, Diane presents. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure what it means if you've been doing something for 45 years and you're still practicing. <laughs> It is, as always, a great privilege for me to be here with you, much beloved people of God from around his globe. Lucky love. 
It is an honor to interact with you and hear what God is doing in you and through you uh, as you work in this very difficult area. And this morning, um, not unlike anything else I've ever done for ABS, we have a difficult topic, trauma in the family. Anyone who's heard me speak knows that I love words and that it is my habit when asked to speak on a given topic to research the ancient origin of the words involved. So today we're here to talk about trauma in the family. In essence, we are considering what ought to be an oxymoron. Words that should be utterly contradictory. Hopefully we will see that much more clearly as we learn together this week. So let's go back a rather large number of centuries and learn about this word, family. There are two ancient origins for the word. The first is Latin, and the literal meaning of that word is servant or the co a collective group of servants in a household. The second ancient origin is Hebrew. And the Hebrew word for family comes from a root word meaning to join. So in essence, a family is a group of servants joined together to serve one another. Each individual serves in a role in such a way as to maintain the joining, not split it. Sounds a little like Paul, actually. He said this, we are servants of Christ. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Each one is given for the common good. The body is one and yet has many members. That is another description of the meaning of family. It has only been in the past two centuries that the word family has been used as most of us think about it, which means father, mother, and children. Last year, in considering generational trauma, we spoke about the original family that God created, Adam and Eve. And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the world. He created a them, single yet plural, which means relationship. They were different from each other, and yet they were one. And he told them together to bear fruit which surely means across all spectrums of human life, not just making babies. He told them to multiply. In other words, make more of the beauty that I have given to you, the good that I have made. Make more in my likeness. Fill the earth with my likeness. Take care of the earth. Command it for good. They were blessed abundantly by God, so they in turn might bless each other, the earth, and succeeding generations, multiplying the likeness of God everywhere they went. So Adam and Eve, in the first human relationship, were commanded by God to be his servants, joined together to spread his goodness, love, beauty, and holiness everywhere they went. Now, when we speak of a family of servants joined together, we're obviously speaking about relationships, which is another word that has some interesting definitions. One of them is narrate. So in other words, a relationship is a story. When we relate to others, we are together writing a story. Another meaning of relate is the idea of motion and carrying something back and forth, back and forth. So a relationship is a living, moving thing. It is not stagnant. It involves two or more people carrying things back and forth, each bearing the impact of the other, weaving their lives together so as to create a story. Think back again to our conference last year on generational trauma. We were very aware during that time of the back and forthness of trauma and abuse in families and how that created a trauma story with profound impact that was passed not only back and forth but down through the succeeding generations. Sadly, we as human beings who have quite lost our way from the beginning often think about relationships as being about 
us. The relationship is for me. It is to satisfy something in me. When that is so, the servant joined with others is there in order to get what they want or what they think they need or what they think they have a right to. But the idea of relationship came from the mind and heart of our God. He created people and relationship. He actually showed up in the flesh and had relationships with us. He has called his church to be a living body of relationships that demonstrate his character. His call to humans from the garden has not been altered. He will be in relationship with us throughout eternity. And guess what that's all for? You? Me? No. It is for him, ultimately, and the praise of his glory. Relationships are about him. We are to carry a likeness of him back and forth and create a story together that brings glory to his name. So our relationships in all various kinds of family are to write the story of him and his character for all the world to see. Do you see then how diabolically opposed to him it is when we have joined together and exploit one another in relationships, or abuse one another, or humiliate or scorn another with words? Do you see how the idea of trauma in any kind of family is an utter contradiction to the ways and person of our God? So when domestic violence occurs in a home that bears the name of Christ, or sexual violence occurs in a church family, or demeaning, critical, harsh, verbal abuse is spoken in a family or a community member, then we have trashed a human being created in God's likeness, and we have trashed the name of our God. So what does God have to say about family? Let's go back to the beginning again. God created human beings to rule the earth and the creatures on it. Please note that he said nothing in Genesis about human beings ruling each other. It was together standing to rule out here, not this way. Ruling was for things outside the relationship. It was to be done jointly, and the outcome was to be fruit and a subdued and nurtured world. Power was to be used to bless both each other and God's world, and it was good. In Genesis 2, we get some more information where God says aloneness for a human is not good. Humans are meant to be in relationship. And so God made a corresponding helper. So we now have two servants joined together to serve and bear fruit, both living under the government of God. But Humans ignored the governance of God in their lives. They put themselves in the place of power. They took it upon themselves to rule their own choices, decisions, and each other. Multiplying and bearing fruit of any kind became painful for all. And having put themselves in the place of God, seeking what they wanted rather than what he wanted, the joining of two into one is now marred. Disobedience to God, what we call sin, was the greatest trauma wound to family the world has ever known. And what is God's response to this massive disaster? In Genesis 12, he says to Abram, leave everyone you're joined to, your country, your extended family, relatives, and your father's house, and I will make you a great family that will bless others, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Please note that he is already predicting that this is not a blessing on one particular tribe or group or family, but it is a blessing on a family so that all families, tribes, and nations should be blessed. 
To bless is to be a servant joined together so as to bring benefit, goodness, and holiness to one another. It is a turning back to God's original design. To bless also means to mark with blood. The redemption from ruin and the restoration of God's ways is of great cost. Genesis 18, 18 says that in Abraham, all of the families will be blessed. And again, after the uh, sacrifice of the ram instead of Isaac, God says, I will bless you and greatly multiply your seed and from your fruit, all nations and families will be blessed. So again, God is already foretelling the blessing to all, not to us instead of them. The outcome of that blessing paid for by blood from the servant of God, is that you and I have open access to the Father once again. The enmity has been destroyed by Jesus' willingness to bear the wounds and piercings of our traumas. We are not strangers, but we are fellow servants together, you and I. And the household of our Father, having been joined together on the foundation of those who came before us, And that family, this family, the whole building fitted together into a dwelling is to bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit of God, all over the world so we multiply his likeness wherever we go. These are the roots of family. These are the truths on which every family of any kind is to be built whether it's our individual nuclear family, extended family, adoptive family, church family, family of faith, family of every tribe, people, and nation. Anything that does not look like this is not family as God designed it to be. Divisions, hatred, abuse, violence, control, manipulation, deceit, exploitation, crushing, humiliating are the cancers that led to the sacrifice of blood on our behalf and are to have no place in any human family of any kind ever. Such things will destroy the dwelling of God in the spirit that has been bought by blood. So with these things in mind, let us now turn to the cancers that many of us know and witness in families around the world or perhaps in our own families, and try to see clearly so we can respond wisely and well, calling every family of every kind to step into the light and learn how to be a dwelling of God in the spirit. We have another word in our title, of course, and that's trauma. And I'm sure just about everybody in this room knows that the original meaning of the Greek word trauma is a wound or a hurt or a defeat, but you can actually pare it down even more because the first few letters, tra, T-R-A-U, comes from the root for the word turn, twist, or pierce. That's what a trauma is. So now we have a group of servants joined together who have been turned, twisted, pierced by wounding who are writing a story together. Someone who experienced many hideous traumas within her own family growing up said this, quote, trauma is not only global around the world, but it is actually global within the world of the person. There is not a single place within them where the impact is not comprehensive and all encompassing. If you take a tour into their life, you will find nothing but ruins. Ruins that need excavating in order to find even a speck of life remaining. Now you think about this description, and then you think about what God says a true family is supposed to be. Humans join together to serve, but instead they create ruins and crush out light and life. Again, the phrase trauma in the family is a staggering oxymoron that is utterly ungodly. That is both a description of this world and its various kinds of families due to our disobedience to God and a description of an individual being formed, shaped, marinated 
within a traumatizing family, whether it be nuclear, tribal, national, or faith. So come with me and let us traverse this globe that all of us live on and try to see what God looks out when he looks on the various families of this earth. We spoke about this not too many years ago. Many family groups are fleeing their homes because they are refugees. There are 50 to 60 million of them in the world today. Whether they are from the family of Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Burma, South America, Central America, families, tribes, fleeing home, breaking up the family for safety's sake, hunted, hated. The wreckage of those families will have tentacles reaching down through generations. The UN recently came out with a stunning and grievous report on violence against women globally. And again, you think of these things in the context of what we think of as family. Family homicides, again, an oxymoron. The victims of this violence are 64% women and 36% men. That means that those victims found home, which is supposed to be a sweet word for where family dwells, to be the most dangerous place on earth. The report says that 50,000 women were killed by their partners in one year. Women face the greatest danger and are the least safe in their own homes, statistically. Globally, one in three women suffer from abuse and violence in their lifetime. And again, the vast majority of that occurs within the home, the tribe, the church, or the community, all families. Violence begins before birth. Males are more valued than females in some cultures, and so selective abortion and infanticide are carried out. The most vulnerable human, a child in the womb, is deliberately killed simply because she is who God designed her to be. We are literally erasing God's artwork. About 140 million women have undergone genital mutilation worldwide. Deliberate, permanent change and damage done to female bodies, which again were created, fought up by God. And the outcomes affect marriage and sex relationship in the marriage permanently. Rape is one of the most understated crimes in the world. When it is reported, it is mostly about males raping females, which means the statistics we have on the rape of males are often unrecorded, but that does not mean it does not happen. And we are seeing more and more in the news about that as men are stepping forward about their own histories of sexual abuse and rape. The rape of males and females occurs in families, in communities, and in churches, all groups, again, that we would define as family. Listen to some stories of trauma in families. The first is about a girl who was considered a mistake. She was meant to be a boy, and upon her return home from the hospital, her father stubbed his cigarettes out on the back of her tiny feet because she had the audacity to turn up not what he wanted. She grew up in filth and neglect, she was brutally battered, sexually abused by her father, her uncle, her cousins, and many other men. She was trafficked across state lines in the United States and watched her father hold out his hands when he came to get her to receive money for leaving her there. Her mother sent her to school and church only when she had no obvious marks on her body. Her daddy was an alcoholic, a rapist, a batterer, full of rage, and a seller of girls. She grew up thinking she was trash, full of terror and fear, and not even knowing what love would look like if she met it somewhere. She rarely spoke. She loved books, and she read voraciously when allowed. She grew up longing for the God she had heard about when she was allowed to be at church and dropped off there by her father, but she was also certain that the God that she heard about would not look at her or love her ever. How could God possibly love a mistake who was trash? 
No one at church ever asked her questions, though she obviously was a neglected child and frequently absent. She assumed it was because she did not matter. A second story. Let's say you're a pastor. And Sarah and her husband attend your church. And he's very helpful around the church. And he counts the money from the offerings. And he helps with any needed maintenance. Sarah is very quiet. And she doesn't say very much. She helps sometimes in Sunday school classes. They have two children who are also very quiet and polite. And one day, she comes to her pastor's office. She's very nervous. She cannot look him in the eyes. And she says in a whisper that she's afraid. And he says that's OK. And he waits to hear what she wants to say. And eventually, she says this. My husband gets angry sometimes. He continues to meet with her and listen, and over time learns that her husband batters her until she is bruised where it cannot be seen, bites her, has held a gun to her head, and terrifies the children, and then comes to church and collects and counts the offering and helps with the maintenance and smiles. He will tell you he is head of the home. And his wife and children do not always do what pleases him, which is what God told them to do. He is helping her obey God. Third story, last one. A girl grew up in a home where she felt loved, but it was a bit chaotic, and there were lots of kids, and her mother suffered from intermittent depression. The little girl was lonely. So one day, a friend a peer invited her to come to her church with her, and she did. And they had a great youth group and a young pastor who ran it, and he was energetic and warm and had a pretty wife, and they were kind to her. So she went, and she loved it, and she attended every week. She wouldn't miss it. And the youth pastor was a lot of fun, and he taught them lots of things about God, something she'd never heard about at home. She was hungry to know more. He paid attention to her and offered to teach her individually so she could learn more about God. He would take her to the local sandwich shop and get her lunch and listen and answer her questions. It was wonderful. She felt special. She felt like she mattered to the youth pastor, but even more to God. And one day it got weird. The youth pastor started talking about how special she was. And how he wanted to see more of her. And he started touching her. She didn't like it, but she was afraid to say so. And she kept telling herself she just misunderstood. Eventually, one day, he drove her home. And on the way, he forced her into sex. She was in a lot of pain. She was 13 years old. She tried to tell her friend from church. The friend's mother told the senior pastor, but he never called. No one asked her any questions. And one day, a lady at church sat her down in the back pew and said she probably ought to stop coming to the church because they did not want her to damage the youth pastor's reputation. Her friend quit talking to her even at school, so she disappeared. And years later, she read in the newspaper that the youth pastor had been arrested. It turned out she was not the only one. No one came to speak with her about it. She never told her story again. And let's say 20 years later, she comes to your church and sits in your pews, still hungry for the God she longed for when she was 13 and terrified certain that her search for God will result in more hurt, denial, and silence, it took tremendous courage to even walk in the door of the church and sit in the pew. And she will listen to you teach and wonder what you would do or say if you knew her story. She does not trust the family of God's people or their leaders. These are graphic examples and true ones of trauma in different kinds of families. They are all about people who are part of the church family. Many of them come from families or church families that have for generations used the scriptures to sanction or overlook trauma in families. Scripture has been used by God's people to justify violence and abuse. How can these things be? Go back to our understanding of family. Servants joined together 
to bless those in the family, those around them, and the future generations. The result of that joining in service is to bring forth fruit that looks like God. These stories illustrate the destruction of family. These stories are about families that bear corrupt fruit, damage humans created in God's image, and narrate a story of trauma rather than a story of love and likeness to God. And many of these stories have been sanctioned by the scriptures. In every case, God's word was used, twisted, to justify ungodly, damaging actions that crush human beings. So think with me. Are we serving God's purpose for family when we beat, curse, or manipulate family members? Are we serving God's purpose for family when we cover up violence or sexual abuse or rape and battering in our homes or in our churches? Are we serving God's purpose for family when we take scripture and use it to excuse or sanction any of these ungodly deeds? Should not our own families and church families be places of refuge, of holy sanctuary? Families are to be a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Where the spirit is, we see fruit that looks like Jesus, who was loving and kind and had self-control and was gentle and faithful. When any family, nuclear, church, or community, tribe, or nation bears the fruit of abuse, violence, cruelty, demeaning words, shaming, and terror, it is not a dwelling of God in the spirit. I don't care what the people in it call it. It does not bless those in the family. It curses them. And for any Christian individual or group to find such actions acceptable, and use God's word to whitewash evil deeds is to utterly abandon God's truth, his will, and his character. It is to profane the name of our God, who is a sweet refuge, a safe place, and a sanctuary. He is our home. He is what home should look like. G. Campbell Morgan, an old Scottish theologian, said this. Sanctuary means not being complicit with those things that make sanctuary a necessity. People run to sanctuaries to escape things like abuse and rape and violence and terror. When sanctuaries tolerate these things in their midst, we leave the victims without a taste of the God of refuge. Where is a boy or girl to go if they are being exploited in the house of our God? Where are they to run to? Where is a woman to go? She's being beaten in her own home behind closed doors. Where is a man, woman, or child to flee if they have been raped in their community? If home, church, and community provide no refuge, then how will they ever know that our God is a refuge? There are two major influences, I think, on our thinking about family. I think we need to consider them carefully as Christians. The first is culture. You know, culture is a funny thing. It's sort of like oxygen. You know, you just breathe it, and it's there, and you breathe it, and that's what you do. And we often don't stop to think about what we're inhaling unless the air is so nasty we can't avoid it. It's just what we know. We all come from and are influenced by many cultures, the culture of our nation, our community, our faith, our family, traditions passed down through generations by all those groups. These things are what we think, and often they are unexamined. They are what we do. In general, we often do not even see the culture in which we live until we encounter something different, and I'm sure there are quite a few people in this room who first came to the United States and went, you do what? Probably a lot of times when you're right, too. But I, I suspect you have a heightened awareness of culture and how it can be different, and a different culture can shine a light on something in yours and you go, oh, that's actually not good what we're doing. Our ideas about work, gender, family, relationships, worship are profoundly shaped by culture. Our absorption of culture can be unconscious. It is simply what we breathe. And of course, because it's ours, it is right and superior. 
It's amazingly easy to be anesthetized to the surrounding culture and blinded by it. And sadly, that means that we do things, agree with things, and even adamantly protect certain interpretations of scripture simply because it is our culture. Unless we are bumped in some way, we can blindly be doing things within our families that we think are good that are, in fact, ungodly. There's a second culture that we all breathe. We all want to be comfortable somewhere, right, to fit in and feel at home. And so we let ourselves think that Christendom is safe. And we fail to see and discern. Instead, we listen or follow or remain silent and just ingest what we're told. It is easy to simply accept what we are taught, especially if a Bible verse is attached to it, and assume it is therefore God's truth. I fear many of us have confused Christendom with our little, or our little corner of it, with Jesus Christ. They are not the same. They have never been the same. Our places and systems are not Jesus Christ, nor is Christendom actually the same as the living body of Christ. Jesus himself told us that when he said there are tares among the wheat, there are wolves among the sheep, and there are whitewashed humans, which means they look nice, posing as believers, sometimes in leadership. This is why Paul called us to discern, and back to my word thing, that word literally means to take apart, to examine, to call things by their right name. And by that I mean drag the whole thing to the light of God and speak the truth about it with him as the reference point. Not what I prefer, not what my parents taught me, not what my church says, not what my country does. Him as the reference point, and only him. And if we examine him and look at the character he displayed when he was here, we will find not one single justification for violence and abuse in any relationship of any kind, no matter what. None. So when in our cultures of country or community or faith, we hear justification for violence against a wife or child and take something from the written word of God to support what is utterly unlike him, we have failed our Lord who is truth. We have used the written word to serve our traditions and human ways rather than having our human ways bowed down to the character of our God. We have used God's word to sanctify unholy deeds. I fear you and I think relationships are about us, and for us, and actually they're not. You know, we're not the center, actually. We're not the grounding. We're not the reference point. God is. Again, go back to the garden. You know, the garden was something God made up. He created it. It all came from within his heart and mind. He said it was all good. It came from him. It is in some fashion a demonstration of who he is, and it brings him glory. And that's not just true about the trees and the flowers and the birds and the mountains. And it's not just true about male and female. It's also true about relationship. He made it up. It came from him. It tells us something about who he is, and it brings him glory. So relating what you and I do here on this earth is about him. It teaches us and others who he is. He's Trinitarian. He created people in relationship, and he showed up in the flesh and related to people. And he has called us as his church to be a living body in relationship, whether it's in marriage or parenting or local church or community or government or anything else, to do that relating in a way that makes clear for the world to see who our God is, what his character is, and what he loves. And that's not all just for you and me. It's not like, you know, you get married and that person's supposed to serve me. No, you are joined together to serve him. It's a completely different framework. So you think about this, think about your culture, think about Christendom, think about your own family history, think about your own life. You want to know how to treat a woman? Don't look to your tradition. Don't look to your culture. 
Don't study your family history and then copy it. Study him and study his safety and his grace and his respect and his kindness to women. You want to know how to treat little children? Look at him. He stopped. He bent down. He welcomed. He blessed. God in the word and in the flesh together help us keep from taking our family traditions and cultures and using them along with the verse to sanctify those things that look absolutely nothing like the word made flesh. It's not about us, folks. We've got it all wrong. You just think with me about how we evaluate relationships. We pick who we want. We expect what we long for. We want what we want. We discard what we do not want. We're offended and angry when we don't get it. Who does that make it about? Me. Our relationships are about us. That's how humans think. The demands and expectations come from us. We want them to look like us, and they are expected to bring us glory, which means make us look good and feel good. But listen carefully. If there is any arena in any relationship in our lives where God himself is not the reference point, no matter what, it will end in some form of destruction. No exceptions. It was true for Adam and Eve, and it's true for us. Now, if God didn't give us relationships just to feed us, but rather for his own glory, what does that mean? He didn't create relationship just to do a nice thing for us so we wouldn't feel lonely. He gave it to us to look like him. Relationships are not just some adult toy he made up so we would all have a better time living on this earth. You think about it this way. Our God is the all-glorious one. We sang that this morning, holy, holy, holy. He doesn't simply show us these things. He is these things. So any sliver of beauty or speck of love or glimpse of majesty in a human being points to him, reminds us of him, gives him glory. And because he is the source of all that is good, it is his desire for his loved creatures to look like him. Because where we look like him, it is good. He said so. When Adam was alone, God said, mm, not good. Where we do not look like him, it is ugly, destructive, and full of faith. We are meant to be in relationship, but we are meant to do so looking like him. That is the purpose of relationships. There's a way that relationships, whether it's marriage, whether it's friend, whether it's church relationship, whatever it is, there is a way that relationships show the world who he is. They're not given to us for us. They are not given to make us happy. It's a place of sanctification, actually, to make us look more like Jesus Christ so that God will receive glory. So relationships are, in essence, a much-needed sanctification factory. We're on the factory belt, you and I, and we need tweaking often. God is in the business of cleaning out our hearts and our minds. The end product is likeness to Christ. The eternal result is glory to God. You see the shift in focus? Normally, in difficult relationships, we focus on our hurt or the other person, or we try to get them to stop hurting us, which is not necessarily a bad thing to do. But it's different if you do it with God as your reference point and likeness to Jesus as the goal. Because then you respond by bowing to the Spirit who searches our heart and life so that however we respond or react will actually give God glory and change us to look more like him. He is not in the business of serving us by fixing everything that is outside us to our satisfaction. You who work with trauma know that all too clearly. Some of us are working with or living in relationships full of sin. Addictions, pornography, rage, abuse, infidelities, you and I often hide another's sin because we don't want the messiness of exposure. We're not to make another human being or human institution our reference point instead of ourselves. 
and you're certainly seeing in the news here in the United States, many Christian institutions that have made the preservation of that institution or organization their reference point rather than Jesus Christ and covered up years, decades of gross sin against God's lambs. God is a God of light and truth. Every relationship we have is to reflect that. Some of us want to hide our own sin and hold on to it because the fruit delights us. We prefer what the book of Numbers calls the grave of our craving rather than the food of God. What does Christ-likeness look like in the face of ongoing sin in a family, a relationship, or a church? Does it pretend it's not there? Does it pretend the relationship is pretty when it's full of poison? Christ spoke truth and exposed the sin that had a grip on human hearts. He also responded with grace and humility when dealing with the sins of others. To cover up any violence, abuse, or cruelty in a family is to ignore a cancel, cancer that will eventually kill. So just look at me, with me briefly at who Jesus is, who God is in the flesh during a relationship with humans. When he was with us, he was with people who loved him and followed him. He was with people who disappointed him, betrayed him, abandoned him, and killed him. How did he know what to do? How did he survive cruelty and grief? How did he live with humans who were never what he longed rightly for them to be? They always fell short. He answers that for us clearly in John 17. For their sakes, yours and mine, I sanctify myself. For their sakes, said our God, I am on the factory belt being made holy so that they too may be sanctified and made holy in truth. Do you hear what he's saying? He entered this ridiculous, earthly, often crushing sanctif sanctification factory with us. In this place on this earth, relating to humans who hurt and disappoint and abandon and kill, there among them, he said, I sanctify myself. I am made holy for their sakes. In other words, whatever they do or fail to do, I am made holy because God the Father is my reference point. However they act, I will display the character of God in return. Whatever they do, whatever they choose, I choose to make God my reference point and have him work in me so I look like him in this place, no matter what happens. So through him, God's heart and character were lived out in the flesh in this world. So when people sin, he said, this is what God looks like. When people disappoint, this is what God looks like. His heart was full of God, and that meant whenever he was bumped, God's character spilled out. He was truth and light in the midst of sin. He came and dwelt among us, and he brought us the character of the Father in the flesh. And he has called us to do the same, demonstrating for others this is what God looks like when who you love abandons you. This is what God looks like when a child disappoints or leaves. This is what God looks like when someone hurts you or speaks falsely about you or betrays you. He chose to live looking like God so that we too might look like him. Paul says there is one body and one spirit, and in Christ the whole family is fit together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each one of us which causes the growth of the family for the building up of itself in love. Together, you and I, in relationship, a dwelling of God in the spirit. We are individually and collectively in all of our various family circles to carry on the DNA of the spirit of God. Isn't that what children do? They carry on the DNA. And that DNA is to be found in our families, it is to be found in our churches, it is to be found in our communities and in our tribes and in our nations because you and I look like Jesus Christ. Any human interpretation of the written word of God that does not carry the DNA of the spirit is false. Word that does not carry the DNA of the spirit is false.
any trait, any tradition we have inherited from other humans, any culture we have breathed in is not to be obeyed ever unless it looks like Jesus Christ. You see how relentlessly God pursues us? Do you also see how relentlessly self-centered we are? Do you see how we make family relationships all about us? And how we continually turn aside from allowing Christ to develop himself and his likeness in us. We use others for our own ends. We take what is God's and use it for ourselves. So look at Jesus with me one last time. He is God. He is all beauty and power and love and holiness. And he came down here and looked like us so that we could see the Father. He came and walked in little places with mean people who failed to love him and who covered him with their sin. And the result is an amazing one. The result is glory to God. That's what your families are about. That's what your trauma healing groups are about. You carrying the DNA of the Spirit of God, never sanctioning anything that doesn't look like him. And the outcome will be Christ-likeness in you and the glory of God. So think about your own families. What story are you writing? Think about the story of your family of origin. What story did that write? What about the one you're in now? Or the friendships? Or the workplace? Or the church? Whose story are you writing? I would encourage all of us, call all of us, to bow to his work in us in these hard places where our hearts get damaged often until we are looking like him in those places, which means some of us will speak truth that we're afraid to say, and some of us will be kind, which we really don't feel like doing at all. But it will give the world a taste of the Father because it will give, him, give the world a taste of families without trauma and rage and violence and abuse. And we will make other families hungry for our God. And when you weep, which you will in this world, and grieve, or are hungry for attention or whatever, remember again that those relationships that are failing you are also given by God for the purpose of making you look like Jesus Christ. And he says to us, in our various relationships, the ones that are old and gone, the ones that are new and the ones yet to be. Come, he says, come to me because I will one day satisfy all the longings of your heart. You will find, not find your longings responded to or filled in the broken cisterns of human beings. I'm the one who will freely give you the water of life. And that aching abyss of your heart which is meant to be there, cannot be filled by humans. It can only be filled by Jesus. He does not expect you to be in human relationships and survive the pain and brokenness you will find in all of them, no matter what, without freely drawing from the well of who he is, his well of comfort and his well of life. So you who are in difficult relationships, hear him say, come. You who are in blessed relationships, hear him say, come. To him, let him be your reference point ever and always, so that any family that you participate in will teach this hungry world about Jesus and bring glory to our Father. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Langberg. That's something to chew on, especially when you're thinking about comparing the DNA of the family directly from the character of God. How is it showing up? What are you seeing? How do you take a talk like that and try to get it, boil it down to a single word. Here's your challenge. 
for those of you who want to continue to participate in Menti. Um, you have here, you can see the code at the top, what single word stands out to you. Maybe it was a word that she said early on. And maybe you cheated like me and put in a hyphenated word. <laughs> <laughs> but you can try to see if you can sum it up because it's good for us to meditate on something. We can hear lots of things that can go in one ear and out the other. That sounds great. It meant something. But what do we want to stick with us? Maybe it's DNA, thinking, whose DNA is showing up in how we talk about family in our churches, in our communities, in our families? Or maybe it has to do with our culture. And in a minute, I will ask you, and hold the slide, keep the slide there for a second, for you to think about, not only today, but for the next couple of days, comparing our culture whether that's your family or your community, your country, you name it, your church. How is it comparing with this picture that we just heard this morning? Where does it need to change? So thank you, Dr. Langberg, for starting us off. We've drunk deeply, and we have a lot more to go before this uh, community of practice is over. So if you'll flip to the next slide, thank you for your additions there. Uh, and the next one after that. So think about this, your culture and your church teaching, how are they lining up? Feel free to talk to your neighbor about this as you go out to coffee break um, and over lunch and then dinner. Because if we hear something and then we walk away from it, aren't we like in the book of James? We saw something and then we forgot what we saw in the mirror. Okay, well it is time for break, but you have there are a few instructions that I want to give you before we do go to our breaks. Because we are leaving this room, many of you will leave this room, and you won't return altogether until 3.30. So, the first thing you're going to want to do is take your things. <laughs> Um, um, whoops. First, I blew something this morning, so confession. Dr. Peterson has made it available for us all to have a free download of his book, Set Free. Um, so take a minute and see this up here. Go to Bibles.com. And you can search Set Free. This is his story of his own early trauma in life and how God redirected his path. So go to Bibles.com, search Set Free, and you can find a downloadable version, and you'll enter the code Set Free MA17. Set free MA17, and that will allow you to download his book and read it for free. So thank you, Dr. Peterson, for that. Oh. Where are we here? So maybe I've, uh, oh, here we go, thank you. So we're breaking from here. We have coffee break outside. As we go, you will be going to three different locations depending on what you signed up for when you registered. Those of you who are experienced facilitators with the trauma healing materials, you're going to stay here. So you'll go out for coffee, you'll come back. Feel free to move forward and sit in the front seats up here. Those of you in the orientation track are going to go to Galilee. Good luck finding that. No, 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 that's <laughs> not what we're doing. Um, Galilee is actually on the far uh, end, opposite end, uh, opposite corner. One floor down, but we will have some guides outside to take you there. Um, that will be on the eighth floor. Organizational leaders, if you signed up, you will first actually stay here for about 20 minutes. And I think, Nate, you're going to lead here on the, well, Nate will lead you to where you go after 20 minutes. So we're going to do something first together, right? 
okay? Uh, so those where you're going, that's where you're going to be for your breakout. And after lunch, you're going to go back to those same locations. And then 3.30 after tea break, you will come back here. Um, all right, I had a couple more notes just to do that. When lunchtime is here, uh, there will be gluten-free lunch available on the counter near the sink over here. The rest of the food will be for us. So if you are able to eat gluten, eat over here first, right? Okay, let's uh, take care of our gluten-free uh, friends and family. Um, during lunch, those of you who are GTRI students of mine, you can grab your lunch and there will be people taking you down one set here of stairs and to Jerusalem on the back side here. And those of you who are graduates of GTRI, if you want to come show up and hang out with us, we're just having informal conversation. I think that's it. Have I missed anything? It's time to have coffee. Uh, we are cutting a little bit into your coffee break. Um, yeah. Ah, wait, we have one more announcement. Sorry. Emily Blackledge from African Leadership has a very brief thing to tell you in preparation for your networking event on Thursday. Hey, good morning. Um, as everybody this morning has already said, this group of people are the experts. So um, we love opportunities when someone takes the mic up here to kind of all of us hear about that. But the reality is each of you sits in this room with a unique experience um, and a unique need. So we're all bringing need to this room. What are we struggling with? What's hard? What's challenging? And we're all bringing experiences and value to add to somebody else's conversation. So in light of what Diane was talking about this morning and the deep desire for us to be a community that reflects the glory and the splendor of the Lord, um, at this table over here, not the one with the coats, um, but the one with the flowers, there is a basket that has tags on it. There are two things we're asking you to do over the course of today. Number one, write on this tag, what, is, what are you wrestling with? What are, where are you stuck? Where are you in need of just someone to walk alongside you in this work? This work is very isolating. Um, you may be trying to work with men and in a particular culture, and that's just, that's just not working. Um, you may really struggle with dealing with someone's shame and not know how to help them move past it. You may need to figure out what does self-care look like. I'm overwhelmed and deeply in need of rest. So what we want you to do is to put on this card what that is for you. Where is your need? What are you wrestling with and struggling with? And then also a way to contact you. Um, as Phil said, we're going to be networking at the end of this week. We want this community to come around you and support you in what that need is. That means we need to know what it is. So I would um, welcome and encourage your vulnerability. Please take as many cards as you need. Uh, put your wrestle or your struggle on there. And our hope and goal over this week is to connect you with people that can walk alongside you. And put it back in the basket. And put it back in the basket. So make sure you don't grab somebody else's card and ride over top. Um, but yeah, we're going to work out the details. Thank you and have a good break. Coffee break.